Hello everybody, Tegan here with High Point. Thank you so much for tuning in to tonight's episode of What is in the Night Sky Tonight. Tonight, I'm gonna be taking you through a beautiful tour the night sky in the month of August. We're going to be visiting several deep sky objects. We're going to bring it back home and see what the moon and the planets are up to this month. So as always, buckle in and let's see what's really out there. Starting off our tour tonight, we're going to stay within the realm of our own solar system and we're going to see what the moon and the planets are up to this month. Dim Mars is now only visible for a short time in the evening twilight and it appears low over the western horizon with a slender crescent moon beside it on the 26th. Saturn and Neptune are observable after midnight with, on average, about 1.3 degrees separating the pair, but you'll need binoculars or a telescope to spot distant Neptune waning gibbous moon hangs to their right on the morning of the 12th. Uranus is also well placed for observation in the early hours, but the pre-dawn twilight belongs to Venus and Jupiter, which dominate the eastern horizon from about an hour before sunrise. The two beautiful planets appear within the same 10 by 50 binocular field of view from the 6th to the 18th, but they are closest on the 12th when just 0.9 degrees separates them. The stars Castor and Pollux appear to their left, and a beautiful crescent moon lies nearby on the 19th and 20th. As far as Mercury is concerned, it's also visible during the last 10 days of the month from around 30 to 45 minutes before sunrise. A crescent moon accompanies Mercury in all three worlds on the 21st. There's a full sturgeon moon on the 9th and a new moon on the 23rd. Now, while we're still within the realm of the planets in the solar system, we're going to remain here just for a little bit as we take a look at the Perseid meteor shower. Typically, the Perseid meteor shower puts on a fantastic show, but unfortunately this year we may be limited because of the moon. The moon will be a waning gibbous on the morning of the 12th when the shower is at its best. As a result, its light will brighten the sky, making it harder to see those fainter shooting stars. This being the case, it might be early to try your luck late in the evening on August 11th before the moon has a chance to sufficiently rise above the horizon. Wait until the sky is dark, roughly 90 minutes or 2 hours after sunset, and then look towards the north and east. If you're familiar with our series of What's in the Night Sky and you've seen us talk about meteor showers, you may know that a popular question that we get asked is, what equipment do I need to best view a meteor shower? Some ask if binoculars or a telescope fares well on a meteor shower. Honestly, all you really need is dark skies and your naked eye. Looking through the eyepiece of a telescope for meteors will severely limit your field of view. and You may not even be able to see a single one if you keep the telescope and other equipment at home and just bask in the beautiful silence of the night sky. That is when your experience will be at its peak. All right, so for our next stop, we will be traveling out way past our solar system to visit the double double, Epsilon Lyra. Here is a great multiple star for binocular and telescopic observers. Just look 1.7 degrees northeast of Vega and with almost any binocular you'll see a pair of identical white stars. Turn a telescope towards the pair, crank the magnification up to around 125 and you'll see each star again is split into two. Hence the name, the Double Double. Double stars are magnificent targets to an eyepiece, especially for beginners. The Double Double can be a little bit tricky if your telescope can't handle magnifications upwards of 125 degrees, or perhaps your seeing conditions are rather unstable. That being said, if you want a little bit of a challenge, take a look at this beautiful Double Double cluster. Next, we're going to be heading to a planetary nebula, Messier 57, the Ring Nebula. This is also located in Lyra. And 57, the Ring Nebula. It's potentially detectable with binoculars roughly midway between Sheliac and Solifat, or Beta and Gamma Lyrae respectively. It resembles a small gray ring of smoke when observed telescopically at around 100 times magnification. Now, while the Ring Nebula might be quite small, it is one of the brightest planetary nebula that I have personally observed through a multitude of different telescopes. Magnifications around 100 to 150 times will bring the nebula a little bit closer. You may be able to see some internal structure if your aperture is large enough, but without a doubt, the Ring Nebula can be easily spotted with a telescope of nearly any size. 
Now that we are finished here viewing the Ring Nebula, let's travel to Messier 22. Messier 22 is a globular cluster in Sagittarius. It's best observed from the southern hemisphere, but it can be seen from the United States. Visible with binoculars, the cluster appears circular and uniformly gray through a telescope at low power, with some resolution possible at around 100 times magnification. As I always say with globular clusters, aperture is key, as is the obvious dark skies. The larger the telescope, the more you can resolve the internal core of those globular clusters and see the structure of stars within it. It's always said that a large aperture telescope and dark skies will present a globular cluster as diamonds on a sheet of black velvet. From Messier 22, we'll be heading to the last stop of our tour in the month of August, it's the star Albireo. Rather than a star, this is a showcase telescopic double star in almost everyone's books. At low magnification, we'll easily split Albireo into a pair of stars. The primary is gold, while the fainter secondary is a wonderful sapphire blue, not to be missed. Albireo was the first double star that I had personally ever seen through a telescope many, many years ago, and that view has still stuck with me. Doesn't matter if you have light polluted skies or dark skies, the beautiful sapphires and the golds from these two stars stand out brilliantly. The darker the skies though, the more contrast that you get between these two colors. Well, that is it for our tour in the month of August. We hope that you enjoyed. If you have any questions, please let us know in the comments below. And if you viewed or even photographed any of these deep sky objects or planets that we've talked about tonight, also let us know in the comments below. Were your skies dark? What kind of telescope or equipment did you use? We love to hear from you guys. Again, my name is Tegan. Make sure to like this video and subscribe so you do not miss any future What's in the Night Sky content or content on astrophotography product reviews. Thank you so much and clear skies.